Okay, here we go. Now we're recording. Okay, so today I wanted to talk, at least at the outset here, uh, I don't want that, there we go, talk about the, the new Bayesian method that's available in non-MEM7. Uh, as I say, it includes uh, an MCMC method now. In addition, uh, you can also do uh, do some, uh, what shall we call them, sort of poor man's Bayesian uh, by, by doing Bayesian modes. Uh, in fact, most of the tools that are available within non-MEM for doing maximum likelihood can be used instead to do uh, I guess what you could sort of call uh, maximum posterior, because that's what we're talking about with a when you're calculating the posterior modes, you're calculating then the the mode of those posterior distributions. So that's sort of a a point estimation method, if you like, that still allows you to specify uh, informative prior distributions uh, within within non-MEM, and that can be particularly handy during your earlier model development stages where you're still trying to figure out what kind of a model structure to use and you don't necessarily want to wait the amount of time required to uh, to get the the full posterior distribution using an MCMC method. But now anyway with non-MEM7 you do have an MCMC method. Uh, it's what I guess we could call a Metropolis Hastings within Gibbs sampling method. In other words the overall framework is still Gibbs sampling but some of the parameters can be bundled uh, as a vector and sampled using the uh, uh, the vector sampling strategy of Metropolis Hastings. Uh, to some degree that also happens within Windbugs but not as extensively as it can uh, within uh, within non-MEM. Um, the, the issue I think with non-MEM is it's somewhat more restrictive in terms of the kinds of models you can have. Uh, your prior distributions are restricted to uh, normal Wishart distribution. In other words, the the fixed effects are you can describe, you can use prior distributions that are normal distributions, and then for the variance terms, those would be described by a, a Wishart uh, prior distribution. Uh, if you want, you don't have any other real options. The closest thing to it is. Uh, my understanding, and I'm not absolutely certain of this, so I didn't want to sort of put it in black and white here. I believe if you do not specify a prior, but if you put bounds on the parameters, I believe that's roughly equivalent to doing a uniform prior on that, but I haven't actually confirmed that that's really the way it functions, so I hesitate to say it with certainty. Um, and then in terms of the remainder of the model, you have the same model limitations as other non-MEM methods. In other words, you can have two levels of random variation. Of course, in our population model, that's typically then inter-individual variation and residual variation. Uh, and the inter-individual variation level is restricted to a normal distribution. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's that's the main downside uh, to using non-MEM. But in cases where the model you intend to use fits within those restrictions, then non-MEM is a is a uh, is a suitable option to consider. Uh, what I wanted to do is at least give you uh, some idea of what's involved in terms of implementing uh, a model using the non-MEM Bayes method. Uh, I'm Making the assumption here uh, that you've had that you have some knowledge of using non-MEM, so I'm not going to cover, uh, you know, the basics of non-MEM here. I'm only going to cover uh, those aspects which are unique to to using the Bayes method within non-MEM. Uh, to do so, I was going to illustrate it using a uh, a canned example here. In this case, a simulated example. It's simulated multiple dose pharmacokinetic data. Uh, so we're simulating 100 milligrams every 12 hours uh, for 13 doses, uh, 24 individuals. So we're going to be doing a population model here. Uh, drug concentrations are measured uh, uh, several times. You can see here basically what you see is a 
dense sampling going on for the uh, first dose and the last dose and uh, and then troughs otherwise uh, in the sampling scheme. Uh, and the model that was used for simulation and that we'll also use for fitting is a one compartment model with first order absorption. Uh, And let me sort of walk you through what the uh, NANM transcript looks like uh, for this. So much of it's going to be the so, same kinds of things you would have seen otherwise. Uh, so what I'm going to do is set up an NM transcript then that runs a single MCMC chain. Uh, and in this case, it's going to run one for a total of 10,000 iterations, the first 5,000 of which we will discard as a burn-in phase in here. Uh, we're also going to use default MCMC settings, mainly because I have no experience with some of the others, but <clears throat> there are there are other things you can do with this. You can influence uh, which which parameters are part of a part of a Metropolis Hastings sampling scheme and which ones are are sampled individually using a Gibbs sampler. Uh, so that's part of it, and I think there were a few other options too, but that was the dominant option here. Um, actually, um, well, let me go ahead and start with this. So the first of all, you have kind of the usual things. You know, you can have a problem statement. We're going to input our data here. So this is just specifying the names of the columns uh, in here. Uh, we've got a data set in this case, and it's just a standard uh, non-MEM style data set. Uh, we're going to do, this is just saying we're going to use our one compartment model with first order absorption and trans2, meaning we're going to parameterize in terms of clearance and volume. Uh, and now here's where we finally get something which is specific to the Bayesian context is specifying a prior statement. Uh, and so the, we're going to be specify a prior statement that's going to use the what's called the NWPRI uh, routine for that. Uh, in the case of the fully Bayesian method, I'm trying to remember, there is actually another routine, but I don't believe you can use it in the fully Bayesian context. Uh, I believe it's only the normal Wishart prior you can use, and that's what this NWPRI is. Uh, then you have to tell it uh, for how you have to tell it how many parameters of different categories are you specifying prior distributions for, and so you can see here it says okay well the number of thetas in other words n thetas that we're specifying prior distributions for is going to be four, uh, the number of etas that we're going to put priors on is going to be three, uh, and then the uh, uh, let's see here oh I'm sorry I actually I misspoke there. Uh, the n thetas is just the total number of thetas. The n etas is the no total number of etas. The number on which we're putting priors are these things ending with p's here. So the nthp means that's the number of thetas we're putting priors on, and here I'm using four. The number of etas we're putting priors on is three, uh, and uh, then the uh, I'm trying to remember what the acronym was supposed to mean here, but it's, it's referring to our residual variation component as I recall here and that's one uh, and then we've got our PK section uh, I'll have subsequent slides I'll have the other sections there but our PK section in here uh, and there's one thing I guess I'll bring out as part of this is one of the things that's described in the manual for non-MEM7 is that for some of these methods particular the Bayesian method and the SAEM methods, they recommend using the so-called mu referencing parameterization uh, in order to do uh, to use those particular algorithms most efficiently. Uh, basically, what what they're trying to do is get you to specify the the mean for the distribution uh, relative to the eta. Uh, and so you can see here I'm going to use theta 1 to represent clearance, theta 2 to represent uh, volume of distribution, uh, and then I'm incorporating, uh, if you recall when we did our PK models before, I would often constrain the KA to be some value relative to the 
terminal rate constant, and that's what's going on here. Basically, this nonsense here is is saying mu3 is actually going to correspond to Ka. The theta3 corresponds to the difference between Ka and that terminal rate constant. Uh, and that we calculate using the reciprocal of clearance and volume, and that's what this bit over here is. So where are we going here? Um, oh, actually, I misspoke one thing here. Sorry, the theta is actually theta one is not clearance; it's actually log of clearance. Theta two is log of volume of distribution. Theta three is the log of the difference between K A and the elimination rate constant. Sorry, uh, and thus you can see all the games going on with exponentials and logs here. Uh, and then finally, to get the individual specific values, then we end up adding our mu's which would be our sort of our typical values for log of clearance, or in this case, the mean of the log of clearance, plus our individual specific random effect here, A to 1, so that E to that then would be our individual value for clearance. Same sort of thing happening with volume and with our, our absorption rate constant. And then finally, or the usual thing, our scale parameter to uh, adjust using volume to get our concentrations rather than the amounts. Uh, to to get more about some of the bits here, by the way, this is down here is referencing you to the uh, to the new manual they put out with non mem seven, which is called Introduction to Non Mem Seven, uh, and it points you to a couple of pages. Uh, one that describes the uh, the Bayesian method in general, and then one section in particular here uh, titled Mu Referencing uh, that talks about that. Uh, so I would so if you plan on using this, I recommend you read that. There's some specific limitations in terms of use of this mu referencing strategy uh, as described here. Uh, for example, you basically do not want to have any mu's on the right hand side of any of these equations where you're defining. Uh, the various mu's here. So, for example, you notice here I used theta 1 and theta 2 uh, on the right-hand side. I did not replace them with mu 1 and mu 2. My understanding is that messes up the uh, the efficiency of the uh, the sampling strategy they use if you're to do that. And I'll be honest, I have not dug deep into the algorithms that they're using for some of these components, so I won't pretend to be an expert on exactly how some of those things are implemented. Uh, let's see, okay, so that's the PK component on here, and you can see where I put our random effects. We have one each on our, our clearance volume and KA. Uh, they're being modeled as, ha as, log nor as having log normal inter inter individual variation in here. Uh, the error thing is actually not specific to, um, there's actually nothing here that's specific to the Bayesian method. I will point out the reason why it's somewhat complicated is because I, I am considering the possibility of censoring due to some values being below quantitation. In fact, before I show you the details here, just point out we've got a couple of items in the data set. Uh, that are going to feed into incorporating the censoring due to limited quantitation. One is uh, we have one column of values that equals the limit of quantitation. And then we have an indicator variable here called type. Uh, I don't. That's not a reserved word in, to my knowledge here. That's just a name we've given it such that when, actually I'm going to forget which direction is which, so let me look at the code. So yeah, the way I've got it set up, if type equals 1, uh, you've actually observed a concentration value. If type equals 2, that means that the value is below quantifiable levels in here. So, so you can see here we've got a couple of if-then-else block or if-then blocks here. So you can see that in the case where uh, type equals 1, uh, it just does the usual thing of y just equals i pred plus your residual uh, random effect in here. Uh, the only other thing I did in this one 
is let me step let's see actually no we'll stay with this page uh notice i've got something called sd times air one uh the way i'm actually going to do this is i'm going to use one of the thetas to model the standard deviation here the residual standard deviation and the uh and the error here, its variance is going to be set to a fixed value of 1 in here. So we're actually not using sort of the sigma block to estimate our residual variance. We're going to be using this one of the thetas, which is defined through the SD. And I think I probably skipped over that. No, it's not up there. I guess it's down further. Or, oh, there it is. There, right up there. So you can see SD I've got defined as e to a theta 4. Uh, in here. This, uh, notice that one of the reasons for using things like the exponentiation and such here is it allows me to enforce the constraint uh, for, in this case, SD being uh, non-negative, uh, but without using uh, the constraints in the theta statements. Oh, uh, let's see what else. Other familiar things here. We've got I pred. Notice I've got that as log F, and though I haven't set it here, the data itself, the DV column in our data, is actually the log of the concentration in here. So I pred then is being given the value for the log of the predicted concentration in here. Uh, these next two statements here are being used to define the likelihood in the case where the concentration is below LOQ. Uh, so we've got just a, well, dumb just me, it's a dummy variable, which is just a, it's just taking the LOQ value minus our IPRED over SD, so that's like a normalized difference then between the LOQ and the predicted uh, value of concentration and then phi is a built-in function in non-mem for the cumulative normal distribution it's, and particularly it's the cumulative standard normal distribution thus the reason for normalizing this by the standard deviation in the previous statement and that's going to give me so that's our cumulative distribution going from minus infinity to LOQ and that is in fact what we want to use for our likelihood uh, in this case. And so you can see when type equals 2, in other words, when the concentration is below LOQ, uh, we want to set y equal to that QMD, which is that uh, cumulative distribution up to the LOQ. Uh, let's see, what else do I need? Oh, the other part of that is related to, in, instead of using the likelihood flag in the estimation statement, instead we're using the uh, functionality uh, in non-mem where you say f flag equals zero if you want to use the standard thing where it's just assuming you've got a normally distributed uh, likelihood or you use f flag equals 1 if you're going to specify the likelihood directly. Uh, so we're taking advantage of that built-in feature in non-MIM. Okay, let's see. Before I go to the next part, I've hit on a bunch of stuff. Any any questions before I go to the next uh, next bit? Okay, uh, let's see, I guess, uh, let's see, I mean, you're asking, sometimes you see Bayes method where it's like B-A, just B-A-Y-E-S, sometimes you see Bayesian method. Well, uh, Bayes as in capital B-A-Y-E-S is just the name that non-MEM uses for their Bayesian method. So the, the term Bayesian method to me is just a, if you say a more generic term, where is the capital B-A-Y-E-S is actually the reserve name that you use in the estimation statement inside of bugs and thus the uh, if you like Bayes is more specific than Bayesian. Okay well let's move on to the next bit here. Uh, next bit is just initial estimates and this is same old same old. It's the uh, same way you would be used to uh, specifying those in non-mem. In this case almost everything I did here for the fixed effects were log log uh, transformed uh, in here. Uh, in this case we're going to do an omega block so we've got three random effects, three etas, and I'm going to do a full block 
omega, and that's what you see here. Uh, and then, as, you, as I mentioned before, for sigma, I'm just going to set that to a fixed value of 1, and I'm actually using one of the eta's, namely this last one, actually is the log of the residual standard deviation here. And then now we're getting to stuff again, which is specific to the Bayes method. Uh, here we're, is where we specify the prior distributions here. Uh, and the one thing to keep straight is the only way non-MEM knows something is a prior instead of an initial estimate is, is the order in which things are done. So, for example, in the previous bit, the first time it sees a theta, that's an initial estimate. The first time it sees omega, that's an initial estimate, and ditto for sigma. The second time it sees theta, those would be the initial estimates for the mean of the prior distribution for theta. Uh, so that's what we have here. Uh, the next omega it sees, it recognizes as being the variance for the prior distributions of theta. So this omega here actually has nothing to do with the omega that describes the inter-individual variation. Thus, it's easy to confuse. Uh, so you can say here, I'm going to put a, I'm putting variances on my prior distributions for my theta. Uh, in this case, I just went with uh, univariate normals for all of them. Uh, this one I did, uh, again, these are very weakly informative. I used normal normal distributions centered at zero with variances of 10 to the sixth in here. Thus you can see the diagonal on uh, on our omega block here is all you know, 1 E6, in other words 10 to the sixth uh, for all of those components and I didn't bother putting in it, putting anything here for the um, off diagonal elements in this. Uh, so that so that's, takes care of our prior distributions for our thetas. Then we have to take care of our prior distribution for our omegas. Uh, and actually notice here, I don't say this is normal up on top for the thetas. It's just that's the only option you have, as they have to be normal. Uh, then down here for our omegas, these now represent parameters for the Wishart distribution describing the prior distribution for the for the original omega we were defining, which is, describes the inter-individual variation. Uh, and here, I first of all, I give a prior for our omega. This is a, a measure of the central tendency uh, for our prior distribution uh, right here. Uh, again, that's now that's going to have has to have the same dimensions. Let me step back. That has to have the same dimensions as we had back here for our original omega. So you can see it's a it's a three by three uh, in here, but you only do the lower diagonal here. And for my uh, prior here, I just started out with a three by three with the variances at 0 0.05 for each of those. I just put zeros in here for the um, for the off diagonal elements but that's still when it actually does the posterior those do not restrict it uh, the off diagonal elements will be estimated as non-zero values and then finally the degrees of freedom for that Wishart distribution and again in keeping with using weakly informative uh, priors here I've specified the degrees of freedom equal to the dimensions of the omega matrix in here and then finally, we get down to the estimation statement in here. Uh, the main difference here is right here, uh, where we say method equals Bayes. So we're no longer, you know, FO, FOCE, or even SAEM, or, or one of the other uh, new methods that are in there. It's called, it's called Bayes, just B-A-Y-E-S. Um, and let's see, I know it requires the interaction statement in here. What I'm trying to remember is why I have the uh, Laplacian statement in here. And I'm not absolutely certain that's necessary. I seem to recall talking with Bob Bauer at one point and puzzling over why something wasn't working, and he recommended putting it in. But I'll be honest, I don't remember why. 
uh, but I don't believe it's absolutely necessary as part of the uh, method equals Bayes, but the interaction is. Uh, here's where you specify things like the number of burn-in iterations, and here in non-mem one you say number of iterations or n iter here that means the number of iterations beyond the burn in iterations so in other words we're doing a total of 10,000 here 5,000 burn in and 5,000 post burn in uh, you can specify a seed in here um, I think there's a default but I don't know what it is for most applications where I'm doing I usually want to do more than one chain and I want each chain to, to use a different seed uh, if I'm gonna do more than one chain so that's something you probably do want to manipulate uh, if you're actually doing multiple chains uh, and then you give it a file name which is where it's going to save the MCMC samples um, the print it means the usual things. Uh, I'm trying to remember what no prior equals one means. I think no prior equals one means that uh, that you're essentially putting in a completely flat, um, you know, a, a completely the sort of the equivalent of putting in a completely flat prior. So it's uh, that would be it's like you're multiplying your likelihood by one uh, when you do that. Um, but normally you would want to say, if you're going to do Bayesian, you're normally going to want to say no prior equals zero as part of that. Um, one comment here, there is no analog to the thin statement that we have within bugs. Uh, it always saves all of the iterations to this file. I'm not aware of any way of getting it to do anything else. Uh, so... So that's pretty much it. So that's that actually is the whole NM Tran uh, NM Tran script for doing this. Uh, let me take a breath here, see if there's any other questions. The next thing I was going to do is actually go ahead and run this thing uh, just to illustrate the process of running it and what the uh, out output looks like. Yeah, well, I'm keeping my eye open. If there are any questions, let me go ahead and go to uh, go to some place where we can actually do this, where we've got a non-MEM7 license. Okay. So, actually, you know what? Let me save the previous results somewhere here. Uh, let's see. Okay, come on, give me, there we go. Okay, the interface is being slow. Hopefully it won't be too painful. Okay, what are you doing? That's not what I wanted. Let's try this again. There we go. Okay, so let's take a look at it. Let me open up a uh, text editor here. Okay, let me grab the control stream. Okay, so if you take a look through this, uh, assuming I didn't make a mistake when I copied it, what you should see here is the same control stream that we just stepped through uh, over a few pages here. Uh, so it should be identical, I think. Double check. Yep, pretty much. widen it here so it's not wrapping okay so the process of running it here we'll just do the the really crude way of just running it directly from uh, 
Uh, we can run it just directly from the command line. Uh, but before I do that, let me give you a look at the data set too. Okay, uh, you can see in this case it's done as a comma delimited data set uh, with here, I, if you recall in the um, in the data step there it said ignore equals C so this first line it'll just treat as a comment in here and subsequently you can see all the elements there's not much to look at especially in a comma delimited form where it's kind of hard to read the individual columns but maybe what I should bring out uh, briefly here as you can see we've got this uh, uh, the uh, we've got an LOQ here which in this case is actually written in terms of the log of the limited quantitation and type which is the very last column and hopefully there's some twos in here to make this at least vaguely interesting come on there's got to be a two in there somewhere looks like I'm not having that much missing data with the particular data set I grabbed yeah, it looks like most of these are non-missing, which makes it less interesting, but uh, but the code that we wrote would handle it if it is missing. Okay, let's not diddle around with the data set too much more. Okay, so to actually let me go back to the script, I guess. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this thing. So I'm going to cheat and just recall the previous command I used. So here I've just got uh, the NMFE7 batch file uh, for running non-mem here. Uh, so I'm going to run that. You can see I was too lazy to change my environment, uh, my environment here to include that as part of the uh, path. But so I had to specify the whole path. Then I've got the name of the uh, control stream and then the name of a file that will save the output. So well, let's just go ahead and fire that up. And it goes through a bit of nonsense as usual. And then what you'll see is um, is this thing is just, I guess that's part of when I said print equals 100 every 100 here. It's showing uh, the fact that it's completed 100 iterations and it gives the value of the uh, uh, the objective function here which is essentially the same thing as the deviance uh, in uh, in this case because it would be minus two times the log of the likelihood uh, in here uh, so let's go ahead and spitting that out and I don't know that we need to sit here and stare uh, at it while it's going through that uh, notice what it does is it actually during the burn-in phase uh, it does a count where it specifies the iteration number is, is in negative terms. So you see minus 5,000, minus 4,900, and so on. And then when it finally gets to the post burn ends, then you'll see, then it'll increment forward using uh, non-negative values uh, as it gets there. And you can sort of see the progress as it steps through these. And uh, generally, you'll though the objective function is not what drives the analysis in the same way it does with the maximum likelihood methods usually what you'll see is a a net uh, net uh, actually which way this is going to be you know I may let me make sure I didn't misstate something here uh, I just realized that's going up. I may have been wrong about that being minus two times the log of the likelihood. Let me check at the beginning. No, it is. I'm sorry. It it is. And what you'll see is that in on average it tends to be going down, though you may see it rise or fall in the short term as it's stepping through the MCMC. Uh, let's go ahead and take instead of staring at that thing going through its paces here. Why don't I go ahead and bring up the um, the results I had when I ran it the previous time. Okay, where is that folder? Uh, 
Okay, so let me pull first of all the uh, sort of the summary results here. Okay, let me just widen it here. So the first thing is it just uh, recapitulates the control stream. So okay, it goes stepping through it, and you can see it's reiterating all the iterations it went through here. Okay, and so you can see here then it returns a few things here. Uh, you get the uh, the average value of the Actually, it says average value, the likelihood function. Actually, what this, I believe, is, I guess I need to double check, but I believe it's actually uh, not the likelihood, but minus two times the log of the likelihood. But I'll, I'll double check that to make sure I'm not misspeaking there. Uh, here, you get an average value there. I believe that's the standard deviation in that. So that would be the standard deviation of the prior distribution of that uh, that likelihood. Uh, you get some what it reports as final parameter estimates. I believe those are posterior means. Uh, I'd have to double check the um, documentation to confirm that, but I believe that's true. So you get it for all your thetas and then for all of the eta's uh, would be next. Uh, of course, it's in the case of the sigma, you just get back one here because I had fixed that at one. And remember, step back here, that for um, eta four right here was our log of the uh, log of our residual standard deviation. So that played the role for estimating uh, our estimating that rather than using the sigma. Uh, let's see, it gives what here, standard, uh, well, it says standard error of estimate from the sample variance. If I'm understanding that correctly, that's that would be like uh, what we had called in some of the summary statistics when we were working with bugs, what we called the naive uh, standard error. Uh, so it's not adjusting for... Um, not adjusting for the autocorrelation in here. So frankly, I would usually ignore these uh, as part of this. Um, yeah, ditto for the covariance estimates that you get at the end. I don't think they're particularly useful uh, in the Bayesian context. In fact, this this whole file is of somewhat limited utility, I would argue. You know, yeah, you can get some fairly quick summaries of the parameters here, and that's about it. Uh, what's of more relevance to us is to go over here, and oh, it looks like our other one finished here too, uh, but we're looking at the same thing. So let me grab this file here. That's the file name we specified in the estimate. Uh, estimate statement. And what you're seeing here is the way which not the way in which non-mem outputs the MCMC -MC samples. It's returning them as a big rectangular table here. Uh, you can see it's okay, where's my little there it is. Uh, you can see we've got the first column is the iteration number, and actually it act, it even includes the burn-in sample. So you can see these negative iteration numbers corresponding to the burn-ins. Uh, and in fact, with with as far as I can tell, with non-mem, the only role that the when you say the number of burn-ins in the estimate statement, the only thing that influences, uh, as far as I know, is the summary statistics that it reports. Uh, in the um, in the output, uh, I should probably check with uh, Bob Barrow to see if it also may it might influence something going on in terms of some adaptive components, uh, but in the algorithm. But I'm not sure of that. Uh, you can see we've got columns corresponding to our various thetas, uh, and then kind of a wasted column here for sigma in our case, since I had put that as having a fixed value of one. Uh, but then you get for all of your omegas here, 
uh, and then finally you get that MCMC objective function or what I believe to be minus two times the log of the likelihood. Actually, the more I think about it, it has to be minus two because it, it's going the wrong direction for it to be the likelihood. And here, so we've got that. And if you scroll down, you just see more of the same. And of course, typically, if you really did want to discard the burn-in phase for anything but diagnostics, you would read this file in and then discard uh, any any rows that uh, that begin with an, a negative iteration number keep the rest and do your summary statistics on the remaining values uh, and so that's that's pretty much the story then of doing uh, doing MCMC in non-mem of course non-mem doesn't have any real built-in ways for doing the various diagnostics you want like your history plots and so on so you so if you're going to use this on any regular basis you need to build an infrastructure around it um, either using one of the various packages people have put together out there or putting something together yourself in R similar to what we've done for the um, for the bugs uh, analyses that we've been doing okay so what what I wanted to do now is I've sort of given you the basic flavor and what's involved in in running it uh, and where I wanted to go next is talk a bit about well how how does it do compared to bugs uh, in cases where uh, where both bugs and non mem are applicable to a particular problem and I was going to show you some information about that so let's go ahead and bring this up again if you if you do have any uh, any questions you know on what we just went through, feel free to go ahead and uh, input those in. I can always jump back to uh, to where we were. Okay, so what I wanted to show you is the results of some work we had done uh, comparing uh, the results using the non-MEM 7 Bayes method and comparing that to results we got using WinBugs combined with Bugs Model Library. Uh, what we did is for a number of different cases, uh, we simulated, uh, I, let's see, we simulated a number of data sets. Uh, in particular, we simulated 100 data sets for each case. So we're talking, and we're talking about a hundred data sets, not a hundred individuals here. So, so we 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 simulate population data sets, a uh, hundred of them for each case, and then analyze all of those and summarize the results. Uh, and this is just a table, sort of going through the various cases we looked at. So the the label here is just a, an acronym given to this, and you can see they were kind of derived from sort of this particular advans and trans that were used as part of the model. So you can see here our AD1 TR2 uh, was data that derived from a one compartment IV model, uh, where we've got. Uh, in this case, we had a bolus given at time zero, followed by a short infusion uh, a day later. Uh, these Ns here, you can see uh, N means the number of individuals in each data set, and OBS means the number of observations per individual. So here you can see we've got 100 individuals in each data set, and uh, fairly dense sampling here. We've got 10 to 11 uh, plasma samples per individual. Uh, then we had a, uh, for the same basic PK model, we have a mixture model where we've got two subpopulations that differ with respect to their clearance. Uh, that one was just a simple single dose bolus, got 300 subjects and eight samples per subject. Uh, we've got another one with inter-occasion variability here. And I won't read through all the details here. I'll just sort of skip fairly quickly through these. We've got a case where we've got a one compartment model with first order absorption. Then we go to some various two compartment model cases here. Two compartment IV, uh, two compartment IV where we've got some covariates uh, as part of the model. Uh, we've got same thing but now sparser sampling. Uh, we've got a two compartment with first order absorption. Uh, and then we've got a three compartment 
uh, IV in a three compartment with first order absorption. Uh, and then we get into some that require, uh, let's see, which one here? That one, okay, that doesn't require differential equations here. At least it doesn't require uh, nonlinear differential equations. It's a linear differential equation model here because it's got a two compartment IV PK with an effect compartment and a sigmoid Emax PD component compartment. So that's a that's a simultaneous PK PD modeling pro problem. And then this F flag one here is uh, we've got a PD component which is uh, which is a binary. So we've got a categorical uh, data element in there. So those are the various cases uh, that we looked at. Uh, in all of these, in this case, we were using weekly informative prior distributions for these. I've actually subsequently been doing some work with informative priors, too, uh, in these cases. But uh, so far, I've only summarized the results where we've used weekly informative priors. Uh, for each data set, we analyzed it with non-MEM7 and with wind bugs. Uh, and for all of these, we used three chains of 10,000 MCMC iterations each. Uh, not so much because that was optimal, but it, it's a reasonable number, and, uh, and it made it simple to automate the process. Uh, for all of those, the first 5,000 iterations were discarded as burn-in, and we retained every fourth sample for our analyses. In other words, we thinned by four. Uh, the results were compared with respect to a number of summary statistics uh, about the MCMC samples, uh, you know, that would reflect things like accuracy and precision. Uh, we compared them with respect to computation time and, uh, and with respect to effective N. In other words, the, we've talked about that before. That would be the, uh, an estimate of the equivalent number of independent samples. So that provides us with sort of an inverse measure of, um, of the amount of autocorrelation. Uh, let's see, oh, I guess I didn't need to keep that there, but if you want, you can actually, uh, if you go to the page site, or I think we've also got this posted on our, uh, the Metrum Institute site, you can download a poster presentation that was given on this. Okay, this is a little tiny here when we start looking at each of those, but these are some plots summarizing some results here. Uh, what I've plotted for each one of the for, well, each panel here that you see corresponds to one of those different simulation scenarios we talked about. And the y-axis here is the percent error in the median of the posterior distribution. And then you can see along the x-axis are the names of the various parameters in these different models here. Uh, and if you sort of scan across these, well, for, also I should point out the uh, these are all box and whisker plots. Uh, the red boxes are the non-mem results. The blue ones are the bugs results. Uh, and if you scan through this, you'll see in most cases uh, the results are pretty comparable uh, between the two programs. Uh, you know, even where there's somewhat larger errors, like in the, this one F-flag example for some of the uh, inter-individual Vari variance parameters, the uh, precision was fairly poor, but there, uh, but in terms of comparing the two programs, they both were equivalently poor, if you like. Similarly, when they, one does well, the other one tends to do fairly similar in terms of estimating this, these, this sort of central tendency of our prior distributions. Uh, now what I'm looking at here is a, again, the panels are all the different cases, the, on the x-axis, the uh, different parameters, but now I'm plotting the percent difference in effective N, and the difference is in terms of non-MEM minus wind bugs. So in this case, what you would like is effective N to be bigger. Uh, so basically, if a box sits above zero, that means non-MEM did better. If the box sits below zero, it meant, meant wind bugs did better in here. And if you scan across those, one of the things that you'll see pretty consistently is that for our sigma parameter, our, our residual standard deviation, uh, 
usually effective n was greater for non-MEM7. For some reason, there was less autocorrelation in that parameter pretty consistently across the various modeling scenarios we had here. Uh, we also saw that non-MEM7 resulted in a larger effective N for several other parameters in a, in a number of these examples. Uh, some of the more extreme ones you can see uh, here, like with this 83TR4 sparse and uh, similarly the 83TR4 covariate model, uh, we saw non-MEM doing consistently better in terms of the effective N. Uh, but then there were other, a few other cases where it flipped on us where it went the other way around, a particularly extreme case here uh, being the model with inter-occasion variability, the variance associated with inter-occasion variance and clearance, um, non-MEM did quite poorly on in terms of the degree of autocorrelation there. Uh, but, you know, so for that case, non-MEM did badly, but for many of the others, it actually did quite well. Uh, let's see, what was the other one I was hunting for? That was inter-occasion. Yeah, I guess that's the main one where uh, where non-MEM did poorly, but on most of the rest of them it did as well or better uh, than non-MEM. Uh, this, this is now looking at histograms uh, sh for the uh, ratio of elapsed times uh, computation times required by non-MEM7 versus WinBugs. So in this case, what you want is, um, well, basically if if the ratio is bigger than one, it meant non-MEM took longer. If it's less than one, WinBugs took longer. Uh, and what we see here is they bounce around. It's um, It was less consistent than I had actually anticipated based upon some earlier reports. Uh, but you actually see a number of them where non-MEM was a little bit speedier. Uh, it seemed to be a bit speedier here for uh, for our two, three compartment cases. Um, and I suspect that's because, uh, in this case mainly, because non-MEM uses a an analytic solution to the three compartment where I had used the um, uh, the matrix exponential solution, so that apparently slowed it down a bit. But there's a few others, too. Uh, we've got, uh, it's not a humongous amount, but in the case of this 82TR2 case, uh, non-MEM was a, a little speedier there. Uh, same thing with the 83TR4 sparse. Uh, and then you saw others that were the other way around. You can see, for instance, in these straight 83TR4, uh, non-MEM took roughly twice as long. Uh, ditto with this F flag. On uh, some of these, uh, the one place where non-MEM really kind of fell down was in the mixture model. And if you look at this, you'll see that it took somewhere around six times as long in here. Yeah, I guess I said that right here uh, to run the mixture model in here. So where are we going here? So what did I say? Yeah, non-MEM 7 required more computation time than WinBugs for a, this list of uh, cases there, six times longer for the mixture model, but then bugs required more time for some of these others. So, you know, for most of the models, it, you know, for when we look across the list of models, it's almost a toss up with the exception of the mixture model where, uh, where non-MEM did pretty poorly. Uh, and let's see here, which one am I looking at here? Oh, okay. This was an attempt, uh, an attempt to sort of create a uh, a metric that took into account both the computation time, but then adjusted for the degree of autocorrelation. So that as you can see here, what I've got now is a ratio, non-MEM seven to win bugs of elapsed time, but then it's that it's that ratio of elapsed time per effective. Uh, sample in here. So this tries to adjust for both of those to sort of give you a net, you know, the, the net uh, comparative benefit of one program over the other. And what you see is that for roughly half of the scenarios, non-MEM7 actually outperformed WinBugs with respect to this computation time adjusted for autocorrelation. Uh, so what we're looking for here, uh, okay, where are we going here, uh, is, okay, again, in this one, 
okay this is elapsed time so when when the number when the boxes are below one that would be a case where non mem 7 is doing better and where it's above one winbugs is doing better uh, so as we go across on some of these things we can see for a few cases here like uh, here on the first one 81 TR2 you can see winbugs is doing marginally better uh, in the case of the our inter-occasion variability model uh, non mem is uh, is doing or I'm sorry, Winbugs is doing quite a bit better if we look at that inter-occasion variance component. Uh, so on that, it's also Winbugs is overall doing better on our mixture model in here. But when we start looking over the rest of them, we see that in several of these, we see here in our two, three compartment models uh, for our two compartment sparse sampling model, our two compartment with first order absorption, our uh, which one's a oh that's the one compartment with first order absorption in those uh wind bugs is doing better uh for for all of those and then for the remainder of them it's largely a toss up uh you can see most of these are kind of bouncing right around i suppose you could sort of call 83 tr4 a win for uh, for wind bugs on that but again for the rest of them it's uh uh, that I haven't marked on here, F flag, AD3, TR4, covariate, and the COMP2L. Uh, you can take your pick on either one. So just walk through some conclusions that I get got out of that, some of which largely just uh, reiterate what we just said. So, and, and of course, uh, something of a disclaimer here. So I say for the classes of models studied in the project here, uh, we can see that the MCMC simulations using non-MEM7 and wind bugs produce results with comparable accuracy in most cases. Uh, non-MEM7 produced less autocorrelated residual standard deviation samples in all of the cases we looked at, uh, and it also produced less autocorrelated samples for a number of other parameters. Uh, the wind bugs uh, required a lot less computation time to produce comparable MC, MC results for our mixture model, and it took about half the computation time for a small, for a few of the other models listed here. Uh, but it required more time and produced less precise results for a number of other cases in here. And then, as I said in the last previous slide there, about half of the scenarios non-MEM7 outperformed wind bugs in terms of that computation time adjusted for autocorrelation. Uh, and sort of the recommendations uh, that, that we thought appropriate given what we saw so far is that non-MEM7 is a recommended platform for Bayesian modeling. Uh, but with the caveat that that's true when the su when a suitable model can be implemented within the limits imposed by non-MEM. In other words, our two levels of random variation, uh, normally distributed inter-individual variation, and priors for fixed effects, and uh, where do we... What do we, oh yeah, I'm sorry. The normal, normally distributed priors for your fixed effects, and then an inverse Wishart prior for the inter-individual variance matrix. So as long as those restrictions apply, non-MEM7 looks like a viable option, and in some cases a superior option. Um, and one advantage to using non-MEM7 is it does provide both a fully Bayesian MCMC method as uh, along with estimation of posterior modes with the same platform. Uh, and that being able to do those posterior modes is good for accelerating your Bayesian model development at the earlier stages. That's something that WinBugs doesn't provide since WinBugs is purely an MCMC tool. Uh, but that WinBugs would be a more recommended platform when you need more flexibility. Uh, you know, for example, when uh, you know, when you need, in particular, flexibility in terms of the stochastic aspects of the model, like when you need distributions other than the normal and the Wishart, or you need more levels of variability. Uh, and we also found that WinBugs appears to perform better 
uh, with mixture models and models with inter-occasion variability, and that WinBugs would remain a preferred the preferred platform for those cases. So, so the net result out of all of that is we thought, you know, we thought that uh, non-mem actually came out pretty good. Uh, out of, out of the whole thing and as long as the models you're working with are you know fit within its restrictions um you know i have no qualms about recommending that you consider using that instead of wind bugs so i tend to be an advocate of wind bugs because i do like its flexibility but uh but hey if you don't need the flexibility then feel free to take advantage of uh, uh of the features that non-mem has I see there's a question that flew by that I didn't pick up. What do we have? <laughs> okay. Yeah, the comment was just made as the other advantage of WinBugs over non-mem is that WinBugs is free. That is true. And I, I didn't didn't include that as part of the equation here. Okay, before I guess I change topics on you here, let me take a breath here, see if there are any other questions or comments here. Okay, don't see anything popping up yet. Well, look, what I was going to do is wander off into um, another topic then. Oops. Um, so, so far in what we've been doing in the course is we've been focusing on examples where the likelihood we're working with uh, is derived from a continuous uh, probability distribution, or equivalently, uh, we've got models that describe uh, describe continuous data. And in fact, I think in all the examples we've done, we've been using uh, data dis where the at least the residual component of the uh, residual variation component has been either normal or log normal. I'm trying to remember, I might have stuck a T distribution in somewhere, but I don't think so. Uh, I think they've all been normal or log normal. But you, d you know, but there's certainly a variety of other uh, distributions that may be appropriate out there, even for continuous data. Uh, but in particular, what I wanted to talk about today is um, at least a subset of uh, of the kind of categorical data that you might encounter out there, particularly in the context of doing various PKPD modeling applications. So, so there are things like, you know, adverse events uh, or count data, for example, that that you may encounter uh, for you may encounter in the context of doing pharmacodynamic measurements. Uh, so I wanted to talk about those, and they're certainly implementable using wind bugs. Uh, and I just listed here, you know, so some types of categorical data you might encounter would be things like binary data, uh, binomial in some instances, uh, Poisson, and I guess I didn't mention it here, but also what's termed ordinal or, uh, or ordered categorical data. Uh, is another possibility. And I just wanted, we've actually got a whole course on this topic, but I wanted to just take a little time here to give you a flavor of what's involved in dealing with some of the, couple of the simpler cases. And in particular, let's take a look at uh, one case where it's a straight binary, where we have like individual data, uh, where something basically occurs or it doesn't. Uh, so it either, so and we'll just model those as we'll just call them zero or one depending on whether something has occurred or not. Uh, and the other case that we'll look at is uh, is binomial data where we're talking about the uh, the a count of something uh, out of some total possible counts. 
Uh, well, I'll explain that more when we get there. So let's go ahead with that. So let's talk about uh, one category of models that's often used for modeling binary data, uh, and in particular logistic regression. And by logistic regression, what we mean is where we're going to fit binary data with models that have a form that looks like this. Uh, so where we're going to say logit of a probability that an event occurs is going to equal some function uh, then of some possible covariates here, which will symbolize by x and some parameters theta. So just to make clear here, so in this uh, in this equation, p here represents the probability that some event occurs. You know, and I give as an example, a, you know, a particularly common category of drug-related event that we use would be some type of an adverse event. So, so p would be the probability that such an event occurs, and then x is a, some vector of covariates. And similarly, theta is a is possibly a vector of of parameter values here. So if it can be described in this way where we've got our Lilogit transform, then we're talking about, uh, then we would call this logistic regression. Uh, and of course the whole trick here is that this Lilogit transform takes this thing P, which has values bounded between 0 and 1, and it transforms them to the entire, to the entire real line so that we don't have to put constraints on what's going on on the right-hand side of this equation. So let's pick an example. We're going to do uh, what I termed here a Bernoulli model for describing our individual binary data. Uh, and suppose we want to model the incidence of some potential dose-limiting adverse event, and we're going to model that as a function of do dose in order to support dose selection. Uh, in this case, the data consists of individual patient results from a study design where it's uh, it's a parallel dose finding study. Uh, I've got 100 subjects per dose arm. Uh, our treatment arms here are four different uh, dose levels, 5, 10, 20, and 40 milligrams. And we've got some uh, potentially influential covariates here in addition to dose, in this case age, weight, and gender as part of our model. And this is just uh, giving you a depiction of the data here uh, on the upper left hand panels here. So we've got two panels, one corresponding to males, the other females. Uh, the y-axis here is the fraction of patients that experience a particular adverse event. Uh, and then the x-axis here is dose. In here, and I've in this case I've summarized this by taking instead of plotting the individuals in this plot, I've taken uh, you know simply taken the individuals from a particular dose arm here, counted up the number that had adverse events, and divided it by the total to get the fraction of patients. And you can see here that it's we didn't even need the smoothing thing here. Uh, it's pretty evident that there seems to be a dose-related rise in the incidence of adverse events. Uh, and then uh, down below uh, are some plots being used to explore whether age and body weight has any influence on the incidence of the adverse events. Uh, again, the, our y-axis here is the fraction of patients with adverse events. And there's a few different ways we could have shown this. One option is, is you could, we could have lumped the patients into age groups. So maybe we'd take you know, patients within each five or ten year interval of of ages here, and I could have counted at, you know, I could have calculated the fraction of patients within that group who had an adverse event. Uh, what's done here instead is to actually plot the individual patients. So those with an event are plotted as zeros, those, or those that did not have an event are zeros. Those with an event are plotted as ones with a little bit of jittering just to be able to see them all. And then used a, uh, a a particular smoothing strategy. Um, in this case, it's something that you could that's called local logistic regression, uh, just to try and get some visualization of whether there seemed to be some relationship between the incidence of 
adverse events by age here and nothing really jumps out uh, in here when we look over it you know there could be you know there's like this one dose group where there's a a hint at a rise and maybe even in this 40 but it's it's not entirely clear it's still a bit ambiguous looking at these and you can pretty much say the same thing here when we're looking at the uh, at the body weight here there's nothing particularly clear there's maybe as we get to the higher doses a hint but it's it's a pretty ambiguous hint uh, when we look at it here. So as I say on here, the dose response is apparent from our summary stats, but the potential for effects of gender, age, and weight and age are, are not that clear by just uh, looking at these uh, these summary plots. So the model we're going to explore here is a so-called linear logistic model in here. Uh, for our adverse event occurrence, occurrences as a function of dose, gender, age, and weight. Uh, and by linear logistic, I, means we're, I mean we're going to take this logit of the probability of an adverse event, and, that is, and the logit of that is a linear function of the various covariates. And I just did a very simple one. I didn't bother trying to incorporate... Uh, any interaction terms or something. We'll just do a fairly simple one just to illustrate uh, the process here. So we can see the logit of that probability. So we've just got, you know, theta 1 plus theta 2 times dose plus theta 3 times uh, age centered around 40, theta 4 times weight centered around 70, and then this theta 5 times an indicator variable for whether or not the uh, uh, the individual is male or female. In other words, I female would be 1 if the individual is female. It would be 0 if it's male in here. Uh, and then finally, the where I, why I called this a Bernoulli model is because this uh, the adverse event itself is distributed according to a Bernoulli distribution. In other words, this AEI here will take a value of either 0 or 1, 0 meaning no adverse event occurred, 1 meaning it did occur, and it's according to a Bernoulli distribution with some probability uh, PAE. Okay, I'm getting the message that I can't hear my voice. Let's see what's going on. Okay, it said my voice is back. Hmm. Well, I guess let me know if that happens again here. Uh, let me check something here before I jump back to this. see. Well, don't see anything else here, so I'll assume we're okay otherwise. Ah, that's what I was looking for. Oh, I guess Joe was, uh, was saying that too. Uh, could somebody give me a clue as to, I mean, how far was I gone and uh, what might I need to recapitulate? Oh, there we go. I was discussing theta 4. Okay, so we weren't too far back. Okay. Wonder why it disappeared. Okay, let me bring this back up. Okay, so I was probably... Okay, so I probably didn't describe that. I was probably just got to this point where uh, I was just indicating that this... I female then is an indicator variable that is zero uh, if the patient is a male and one if they're a female in here. And so you probably didn't hear the bit where I was talking about why I called this a Bernoulli model. Uh, and that's because this 
this adverse event here will take a value of 0, 1 uh, based upon a Bernoulli distribution with some probability here that we call PAE. Uh, notice it's got a subscript I, and the I comes from the fact that each patient might have a different uh, dose, weight, age, and so on in here. So that's why the subscript on that. Uh, put weekly informative priors on all of the thetas here. They were just all normal, 0, 10 to the 6. Okay. Okay, here's what it would look like in uh, in wind bugs then. Uh, so we've got our usual everything inside a model. Uh, so for I, from one up to our number of observations here, uh, we've got our AE, so our data set in here, which I'm not really showing, would have uh, values of 0 or 1 for AE. Zero again, meaning no adverse event. One meaning there wasn't that adverse event was experienced. So it would contain that. It would also contain uh, the corresponding dose, age, weight, uh, the indicator for whether they're male or female uh, in there. And I think I think that's all the elements that would be in the uh, in the main part of the data set here. Uh, and then the data set would also have to include the value for our number of observations. There, so we've got our AE then is distributed Bernoulli, uh, and the one parameter to that is just that our probability that that adverse event occurred that I called here P dot AE, subscripted on by I, and then we've got our logit PAEI, and recall there are, there's a limited number of functions that you can put on the left hand side, like this, uh, and I think it's largely limited to log. Logit and uh, and the complementary log log function. Uh, I think that was it uh, that you can put on the left hand side. But the logit is one of them, and that simplifies writing this. In fact, notice we're essentially writing our model just like we wrote it uh, in terms of statistical notation. So our logit PAE equals then our model here: our theta one plus theta two times dose. Theta 3 times age minus 40, theta 4 times weight minus 70, and theta 5 times our indicator for male and female in here. So that's really the core of our model right there, are those two statements. Uh, then if you want to do some posterior predictions on this, you can go ahead and do that. So notice this ae.pred is really just a repeat of our likelihood statement uh, with a different name on the left-hand side. And of course, ae.pred is now a simulation. That's not something in the data set. Uh, and then finally, we specify our prior distributions. And as I said before, I was just doing the uh, normal 0, 10 to the 6th, which again, in in bugs ease here, it's written in terms of a precision, so this becomes 10 to the minus 6. Uh, so that's how we would implement this this kind of a model uh, in here. Uh, you know, the real, the only difference in terms of the fact it's a um, categorical variable than uh, continuous is really this likelihood function here. Uh, this is just spitting some results back at you here where I used 10,000, uh, three chains of 10,000 each, threw away the first 4,000 of each, then by five, and plotted those so you can see your history plot. So you can see here we've got nice fuzzy caterpillars, so no problems there. And actually that shouldn't be too much of a surprise with a uh, linear logistic model here. We get into some nonlinear models and it might be another story. Uh, and you can just get visualizations of the marginal posteriors for all of our parameters. And then finally we can do like a posterior predictions here. So you can see we've plotted the fraction of patients with an adverse event versus dose. Uh, in this case I'm able to, since it, since we've just got a um, male and female here, just a categorical covariate here. I can go ahead and, and bundle these all up here and calculate it, the uh, the fractions corresponding to those and plotting those with a posterior median and 90% credible intervals about that. So you can see it described the data fairly well. 
and then we're looking at our various uh, summary statistics for our parameters here uh, and you might want to compare that up here this was simulated data here so you can actually compare it to the sort of the true values and you can see those true values up here and compare them for what we have for instance in either the the means or the medians here uh, and I think as I recall the overall they came out reasonably close uh, on all of those of course, we use the exact we we use the correct model, so we have no model misspecification here. So that's an example of how to do a simple binary model like this. The next thing I was going to look at is uh, the kind of thing that uh, we often encounter when we have to do uh, meta analyses on summary statistics that were derived from what were originally uh, categorical data. Uh, and that's what we're talking about here. So now instead of using a Bernoulli model where we're describing individuals, we're going to use a binomial model. Uh, and this comes from the fact that if you think about it, that uh, if you remember sort of where the binomial distribution comes from, it's talking about the distribution of the sort of numbers of successes in N Bernoulli trials. And so this is just reiterating this here where it says a sum then of our 0, 1 Bernoulli distributed binary data items that that sum of those is a binomially distributed random variable. And as I say, in other words, that we x successes in n trials is equivalent to summing over those n binary data items where one is a success in those terms. Uh, when we model the probability component of that model, it's modeled in exactly the same manner as, as if we were talking about a binary random variable and the only difference really is in the final likelihood function. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, an example here. Uh, in this case we've actually got some real data here. Uh, the example is dose a dose response model for nausea during treatment with desvenlafaxine. And all I've done here is just lifted some data from the Pristique package insert uh, where they showed by dose here, they showed the number of patients that reported nausea, the total number of patients, and the percent of uh, those patients reporting nausea. Actually, I think in the original report, I think they just reported the percent with nausea, but they also indicated how many total patients uh, as part of that. So from that, I can get so I've got my number of patients, so that's kind of my number of successes, and I have the total number in here. So for each of these patients in here, you think of each patient as a Bernoulli trial in here, uh, and the so the distribution of this number of patients that report nausea out of the total number then is a binomially distributed random variable. Here's just a, another view of that same data. Now I've put it in plots. So you can see I've got the fraction of patients with nausea plotted versus dose in here. So we want to describe, a, a, we want a model that will capture that uh, since this fraction is sort of an estimator then of our probability. Uh, what I've also done here is plotted the logit transform of the fraction of patients. So it actually you can see it looks pretty similar. But in particular what you'll notice here is when I plot that versus dose, I don't get a straight line. Uh, so that's pretty well telling me right now that using a linear uh, logistic regression would not be appropriate. Uh, at least not without doing like a transformation on the dose or something like that. So we're not going to use linear logistic regression in this case because we're going to cry we're, we need to capture that curvature here. So here's a you know an empirical model uh, that's an attempt to capture that then. Uh, so for our 
probability of nausea here, and particularly the logit of that probability, instead of trying to use a linear model, I'm going to use a model which is linear in the dose raised to some power gamma. Uh, and that gamma is a parameter that we need to estimate uh, in here. So it's not really a, a linear model overall. It's nonlinear with respect to dose, uh, where that exponent is an attempt to try and capture that nonlinearity in here. So that describes our probability, but then for our likelihood uh, statement here, instead of having a Bernoulli distribution, I've got a binomial. Also notice that it's modeled in terms not of the fraction of patients, but in terms of the number of patients out of the total. So we've got our number of patients experiencing nausea in the ARTH treatment arm is going to be binomially distributed with some probability here calculated according to the second line. And the, we also need to specify the number of uh, patients that were at risk of experiencing nausea. And that's the NI. So the data ha will have to contain the number that had nausea, the total number of patients in that treatment arm, uh, and it will have to contain the dose in there. And then, uh, again, I'm just using weekly informative priors, uh, our alpha and beta. I've just used normal 0 to 10 to z sorry, normal 0, 10 to the 6. And then for gamma, I used a univariate going from a f what would be a fairly small exponent there to a, to a fairly large one. Uh, so the non-mem, or I'm sorry, the WinBugs implementation here, uh, it actually looks very similar in a sense to what we were working with before. Uh, the main difference here is that now for our likelihood, our data is in terms of this number experiencing nausea. And on the right-hand side, we now have a binomial distribution uh, with two arguments, so the probability of uh, experiencing nausea and the total number of patients in that treatment arm. Uh, and then we've got our, our statement here describing the, uh, our model for that probability. And again, I used a logit transform. And on the right-hand side there, you've got your alpha plus beta times dose raised to the gamma. And just a reminder here again, we don't have an exponentiation operator in bugs, but we do have this function called POW for dealing with that. And then finally, the uh, we've got our posterior prediction here, our posterior simulation with this end nausea pred component and all of our priors down below here. Okay, so there's our, our model and some results here. Uh, in this case, I uh, used somewhat more samples. As I recall, there was a bit of autocorrelation in at least one of the parameters here. So instead of doing uh, like 10,000 times 3 change, you'll see this is 100,000. Uh, and as I recall, this actually runs quite quickly. So that's, it's not too onerous to do a large number for this particular model. Uh, again, I had for burn in, I just threw out the first 10,000 of each chain and thin by 50. And you can see the results here that gave us our nice fuzzy caterpillars. We've got our, our posterior uh, or our marginal posterior distributions here. And you can see uh, this sort of uh, the plot I'm showing is somewhat mirroring what we saw before here. I did the plot first. Of here we've got fraction of patients with nausea versus dose, where I've got a posterior median here in blue, and then a posterior, uh, or well, our 90% credible interval about that. And then on the right-hand side, remember before I showed you what it looked like in terms of the logit, and I'm just plotting the same thing, but now in terms of the logit transform. So you're looking at the same thing, but with the different transform on it. Uh, again, it you can see that we seem to have captured the data pretty well in that and you got your various parameter estimates and you can see the it's this 0 0.31 here that's capturing our nonlinearity here um, yeah, that we see in that I suppose you could have used something like a an Emacs model in this but I think you'd probably find that you'd be struggling to get 
good unique estimates of both Emacs and EC50 because we're so far away from the asymptote uh, in this case. And yeah. So let me uh, take a breath again, see if there's any questions. Uh, this is actually probably about as much of the material as I was going to be covering today. And I guess while I'm waiting to see if any any questions come up here. So uh, when we get to, um, I guess, this Thursday, what I'll do is be following up further then on our our hands-on example four uh, and uh, and continuing on with that to show you the, uh, the steps in wrapping that up since I guess last time I only showed you sort of the component, Pascal components uh, for this week. We'll... Uh, uh, we'll all go through the the rest of the implementation, the the bugs implementation, and the and the R components for driving it. Okay, if there aren't any questions then today, I think we'll go ahead and uh, bring it to a close now. Then. Uh, and I'll look forward to seeing you on Thursday. So bye for now.